play guitar. I love it. Um, and then the third thing happened was I, I, I got in a play called Grease. Lead guitar, of course. What did you think? I was in a pit. They put this face on there. Um, so I was playing my, my lead, but I fell in love with one of the chorus girls. But it's, it's, the, you know, it's the kindness of God. The girl happened to be in the Church of Christ. The Rockville Church of Christ, not far from here. And she had convictions. So maybe, you know, she wasn't yet a true disciple, but she was like, look, you know, we can date, but nothing. All right? You know, we're going all pure. I'm like, that's different. <laughs> but I respected her, you know. I, it's unbelievable. She talked about God. She never invited me to church because, you know, with my hair down the here and my reputation, she didn't think people like that would go to church. I didn't think I was allowed to go to church, so I never asked. I, you know, I didn't think people like me would belong to church. Eventually, I asked if I could go to church, and some random disciple who went to the University of Florida was home for the summer. Now it's July. It's June. And uh, he was home for the summer, and he decided to help lead a Bible study at the local Church of Christ there. So I showed up, and he knew his Bible. Sat down studying with me. Ten days later, I was baptized. Wow. So I moved up to MIT, called Kit McKeon on the phone to find where church was, and the bus came and picked us up. There were 15 incoming freshmen. In, no, there were 15 disciples at MIT when I joined them, three incoming freshmen. Uh, which three incoming freshmen is pretty amazing from Church of Christ. They got to join But anyway, by the time I graduated, 45 disciples on a campus of 4,500. Uh, just amazing to see how God baptized people like Mark Templar, oh. Mark Brabajan, who's uh, leading the church in Thailand, uh, uh, Greg Kittleson, who's here in the, the church here in Montgomery County. You may know his daughters or something, I think. Uh, I don't know his kids. But, um, but all those people, pretty much all of them were still faithful. Um, through that, uh, you know, Chris Hurst, if you know Colton, his uncle. Cool story real quick. I don't have much time, but oh well. Um, so I, I was reaching out to Mark Templer. Mark was a crazy prayer. He would go running every morning at 6 in the morning. And um, one day, we were praying with, we were studying with uh, Colton's uncle. And um, he was stubborn, very stubborn. So... Mark threw himself into a snowbank. In Boston, it, the snow never goes away. It snows and it just gets, they plow it off to the side and it gets black and then they get bigger and bigger. He throws himself into the snowbank and he says, God, I'm not getting up until I believe that Kevin will be baptized this week. Okay, so he comes back and tells me the story. I'm like, okay, that's, that's interesting. You know, sure enough, Kevin was baptized that week. Later on, you know, Chris, his dad became a Christian. Obviously, Colton's a Christian now. Right. Incredible impact. But you know, campus students are crazy. Yeah. You're idealistic. You know, you, you really believe you can change the world. And I think that is so essential. We were nuts in Boston. We had these dreams that we would go and we would evangelize the whole world in our generation. You know, there was, basically, there was a, a growing church in Boston, and other than that, most of the churches were kind of just adding a little bit. There was nothing going on, but a whole bunch of college students. We had a church of 800, 400 were college students. We had good campus devos. Cranking. You had all the guys from Harvard. I saw Andy Blocker here earlier. He left. But, you know, some of the, some of the, anyway, I won't even go into all that. The point being that, the campus students were the ones who had the vision and helped change the world. Right. And I can't get in front of a campus audience without saying, you are it. Yeah. Right. There's no time in life when people are more open than a campus. That's right. yeah, and you are reaching out to a segment of the population that becomes increasingly difficult to reach as they get older. Yeah. I love the fact that Paulo went to law school and he used some of that you know, ability with his logic and all, and that, that just helped me to understand arguments in a way that was very helpful. I love the fact that Matt was the CIA agent, you know, you're like, those people, they don't usually even say those letters, like, I work for the government. <laughs> we 
we've got several of them. I don't think I'm allowed to say publicly who they are in North Virginia, but you know their kids. And they all start with K. And then um, but um, so you've got those. And now here I am. I was the nerd at MIT. You know, I, I tell you what, pretty much everybody's a nerd at MIT. It's just, you know, Logan makes fun of the way I dress and all kinds of things. And I'm like, you know, can't help it. But it's a blessing. So what I do for a living is uh, cybersecurity. So anybody heard of Obamacare? Yeah. Okay, so it's my job to help the government to protect it from hackers. So I have a team that goes in and tries to get into the website. All my, you know, hacker guys, they're called ethical hackers. They're supposed to do it for the right reasons, right? So um, that's just part of, uh, of what responsibilities I have at work. But uh, if any of you are into cybersecurity and you want to get a job in that way, I have a great company. It's not mine. It's, uh, it's a for, uh, not for profit company. I work for called Mighty Corporation. And uh, just a plug because you're going to need a job when you get out of college. I think, right? It still works that way, right? Or you can just go into ministry. Ah, uh, just go. Okay, so when you go to school, you know, I, I changed my major. I, I was pre-min. Changed my major from electrical engineering to pre-min. You know, that's pre-ministry. I, I no longer cared about school, in other words. You know, my dad didn't like that. So, but anyway, so my junior year, I studied at Harvard Divinity School and Wellesley. So, um, many of you have probably taken, how many of you taken a religion class at, at college? How many of you were, um, stood up in front of the class and made fun of not, not really? Okay. I, I couldn't help it. You know, he's like, the, Jesus never said he was God's son. Like, Excuse me, I, I got a few verses on that, you know. And he'd be like, you are such a fool, you know. And, and so when God's Not Dead came out, uh, I just really could relate to the movie. How many of you seen it? All right, we're going to show a clip from it. So, uh, just to give give some money uh, back for it. Just hit enter. Constitutes right and wrong 
is a straight line that leads directly back to God. So you're saying that we need a God to be moral, that a moral atheist is an impossibility. No, but with no God, there's no real reason to be moral. I mean, there's not even a, a standard of what moral behavior is. For Christians, lying, cheating, stealing, in my example, stealing a great idea and earn a forbidden form of theft, but if God does not exist, as Dostoevsky famously pointed out, if God does not exist, then everything is permissible. And that would be permissible. Well, pointless. Professor Madison is right that all of this, all of our struggle, our, our debate, whatever we decide here is meaningless. I mean, our, our lives and ultimately our deaths are no more consequence than that of a goldfish. <laughs> this is ridiculous. So after all your talk, you're saying that it all comes down to a choice. Believe or don't believe. That's right. That's all there is. That's all there's ever been. The only difference between your position and my position is that you take away their choice. You demand that they choose the box mark. I don't believe That's because I want to free them. Because religion is like a it, it, it's, it's like a mind virus that parents have passed on down to their children. And Christianity is the worst virus of all. It slowly creeps into our lives when we're weak, we're sick, or helpless. So religion is like a disease. Yes. Yes, it infects everything. It's the enemy of reason. Reason. Professor, you left things in a long time ago. What you're teaching here isn't philosophy. It's not even atheism anymore. What you're teaching is anti-theism. It's not enough that you don't believe. You need all of us to not believe with you. Why do you with the truth? You just want to ensnare them in your primitive superstition. What I want is for them to make their own choice. That's what God wants. You have no idea how much I can enjoy failing you. And who are you really looking to fail? Professor. Me? Or God?
Now that you've taken sort of the logic class, you may have noticed from some of the things we learned yesterday, what are some of the things that you saw that he was able to do to help with his argument and help with his presentation? What, what kind of things did you notice? Go ahead. Yeah, he showed, he showed a contradiction in the atheistic logic that there could be a moral ab absolute, you know, and, and just obliterated the argument in that way. Okay. One of the most powerful things from yesterday's class that I took away was, you know, anytime you're talking to a person, you're talking to a person. They bring a unique set of experiences and you kind of have to figure out where are they coming from what would have led them to this decision because a lot of times it is an emotional decision it's really not a logical decision and the game's not won on logic or is it really a game but it's just so powerful yes yeah he knew his stuff so he he had just a few quotes you know you don't need to memorize, you know, all of Plato, Socrates, and all these other great philosophers' quotes, but just a few things so that you speak their language. You got into their language. And uh, if you're in a situation where that's the language that's being spoken, you're going to look foolish if you just try to say, well, you know, Jesus changed me, so therefore, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I mean, it, it really, it, it, we've got to speak their language in order to... Them to understand. Anything else? Awesome, awesome. Um, well, hopefully you were inspired by that. I, if you haven't seen the whole movie, it's it's just fun. <coughs> Obviously, it's probably a little bit set up and uh, much easier to do in Hollywood than it is in uh, perhaps your your class. I do believe this though. You know, the, the one guy there that was um, the Asian guy, he was actually brought up in mainland China in the story. And it's interesting that he came from that atheist background. But the thing I noticed is that in your college campuses, people are watching. They're watching your life. Remember, I lived in the dorm with Mark Templer, and Mark was actually a, yeah, you know who Mark Templer is? He started like the Bangalore church, and they were called the Bangaloonies at the time. Um, and then he, he went over and helped lead many of the churches in India, build the whole work over there in India, even led the UK church at that time. So uh, an amazing guy. But he was um so he was in uh in the dorm and he was persecuting us uh, at the time and, and I asked him later on what was it that caused you to turn? And he, he just said, you know, the consistency of your life. And he didn't not just me, but the other disciples. I just saw the way you took the persecution, the way you responded, and it was your life that convicted me. People are watching what we're doing. So I have a class today. Let's see how much time I've got. I've got an hour, right? So we'll do our best to, to do it in that time. We're going to talk about what, did Jesus really exist and did the resurrection happen? I think that, you know, we've got to start with the Bible. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians 1. I'll try not to preach this verse too much. I believe it preaches itself. The other good news is that several slides in my presentation were already covered by wonderful, smart people yesterday, so I can skip over them. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? One time, Doug Jacoby did a lesson where he described the biographies of the different philosophers. It was actually one of the saddest lessons I have ever listened to because the number of suicides and just pathetic end-of-life stories because the philosophies were unable to meet the basic questions in these people's lives. Just an interesting study. Um, let me keep on going, though. Verse 21, For since in the wisdom of the world, through its wisdom, did not know him, 
God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs. Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Gentiles, Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness holiness and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness, fear, with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. When I was at MIT, we had multiple uh, campus ministers. We had Steve Johnson, who's like an you know, amazing guy and started the church in New York and wrote Upside Down and Men Who Dream and some of these songs. Just, you know, brilliant mind. He was reasonably fruitful there, a little bit. Um, then you had Jim Blau, who's like a genius. Master's degree at MIT, straight A's. Never got a B in his life, you know? It just makes me sick. <laughs> These are the two brain types, you know, where you're like, you have a backup processor in there doing extra work when you're not. I don't understand. So then we had this guy, and, and I won't mention his name, you can ask me later, but he didn't have a college degree, barely graduated from high school, took his GED. But he loved God, and he was the most radical guy. He's like John the Baptist. Came in and preached to these intellectuals and just baptized a boatload of people. That was the person who helped win most of the MIT people over to Christ. And I think, you know, you may not be a intellectual genius. And I know intellectuals will try to bully you using their mind, that puff themselves up, as it says here in 1 Corinthians. Do not believe for a minute that it's your wisdom that's going to convert anyone. It really comes down to us trusting in Jesus. We can stand by the fact. We should not be shaken by the facts. That's what we're going to talk about today. But the real truth is something that's changed our lives. We don't have to puff ourselves up with better vocabulary. Oh, sure, learn a few words. Be humble, speak their language. But I will tell you this, the older I get, and I'm old now, officially, I turned 50 last month, so I'm definitely old. Um, the older I get, the more I realize, remember that passage they want to take out of John chapter 8, where they're about to stone the adulteress? Who, who is the ones who walked away first? The oldest. Wisdom comes with age. And it's not that you know all the answers. It's that you don't and you're comfortable with it. Right. Somebody asked the why question. Why did God do this? Sorry, Jack. God didn't give you answers to why questions. He doesn't. Why is in his realm. Science gives you no answers to why. We've got to stick with the how questions. So we will ask some how questions today. Did Jesus really exist? And what happened with the resurrection? So, those are some of the books we read, obviously. Here's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to address some of the skeptics' questions. So we'll talk about some of their arguments. We'll identify the most reliable historical source. Which turns out to be the Gospel. Luke is considered one of the greatest historians of all time. 
And the funny thing about the Bible, you know, we're talking about the historicity of Jesus, the historicity, you know, the accuracy of the Bible. What's the second most accurate book in the world? My point exactly. Right? There's not even anything close. What's the second book? What's even close? Nothing. Not a single book. It's not like, oh, there's the Bible, and then there's the Bhagavad Gita, and the Quran, and they're just kind of buying for number one. What's the best-selling book of all time? What's number two? Who knows? Maybe now it's Harry Potter. Nobody knows. You know. Okay. So we'll talk about the Gospels. Then we'll try to corroborate the Gospels with some of the other historians. You ask what other historians wrote about uh, the Scriptures. Which, oh, I'm sorry. Um, and then we'll try to verify the facts with some archaeological evidence. I love archaeology, not because I know anything about archaeology, but I've been to some of these places, and when you see it right in front of you, you're like, oh, Pilate's name from the first century in a rock. That's just cool. I don't know. It, it, that's all right. Then we'll do a case study on the resurrection. So, you know, when we talk about evidence, we're not talking about emotion. We're not talking about emotional argument. You know, the truth is that most of our preaching is actually not necessarily logical. We're not like, I'm going to convince your mind A, B, C, therefore D. You know, we really preach from emotion. We break a lot of those rules of logic that we studied yesterday. And you know what? It's okay. Be humble about it and try to learn something so you don't say something stupid. Because sometimes people in our church will get up and say things that a scientist is looking at and going, that is not a good argument. We have to be careful with statements that are absolute. <laughs> we must never say a statement that's an absolute. Absolutely. Did you get it? You know, and so we talked about an explanation that fits the facts. That was a sort of abductive reasoning. We talked about an argument. If it doesn't have evidence, it's just an opinion. And I will tell you what. Everybody's got an opinion, including you. And your opinion is great. You're welcome to share it. It's your opinion. That's different than fact. And we've got to be very careful because even in some of our Bible preaching, Part of the reason that the teaching ministry was established, and I know this because Doug Jacoby helped start the teaching ministry, the teaching ministry was established, and I worked for Doug Jacoby, I mentioned that, I don't even know what I mentioned, but I worked for Doug Jacoby back in the day when he first did the ministry training program. I graduated with Ed Anton. And we argued with each other who had the best score in the class. I think he did. That dude's smart. He's really smart. But anyway, so Doug Jacoby started the teaching program because he noticed in some of our sermons we were misusing scripture. Yeah. That we were violating the rules of logic. We needed to rethink, take an objective look at ourselves, yeah. learn something from people who've already studied this, and stop making mistakes that discredit ourselves unnecessarily. There's no reason to go in and do something that completely discredits you. Become all things to all men, right? So, we don't want to just assert our opinions. Just simply, eyewitness is one of the best types of evidence, right? If I have a guy here who said, I saw it. Now, we all know if four eyewitnesses write down their accounts of an event, it's going to be different. But I like what Paolo was saying yesterday about the scriptures. That we're, even though you have four Gospels who look at things very differently, just because one guy says there were two, um, two guys who were scraping themselves called Legion, you know, the, the, in the, the tombs, and, and the other one says there was one, it doesn't mean it's not the same exact facts. One guy's talking about the fact that there were two present. The other guy's talking about the fact that only one of them spoke. He was the only one who engaged Jesus. The other one was sort of irrelevant. And, you know, sometimes we get caught up on the facts because we think that when we read into the facts that we're getting, um, we're, we're finding a contradiction 
between eyewitnesses, when the truth is, every eyewitness is going to have sort of a different set of facts that they use. And some of them will actually be wrong. Our perceptions are actually sometimes wrong. With the Gospels, it's amazing to have as much eyewitness as we did. There's documentary evidence. That means things that are written down. So we talked a lot about that yesterday. There's corroborating evidence. So other than the, the Gospels that have been written down, we have outside sources that, that corroborate the evidence. And then we have scientific evidence, which is the role of archaeology we'll, we'll talk about. And then there's rebuttal evidence. So what about the arguments that other people bring in? How do we address those? So there's different types of evidence. We don't want to ignore them. I also want to say this, you know, apologetics is a very wide open field. We've only talked about a few subjects in here. One time I listened to Tom Ziegler. You know him, Nick, and uh, Katie's dad? He's an elder in Northern Virginia. He's a pharmacist. And he went through sort of the pharmacology of the Bible. It was amazing how accurate the Bible is in giving medications that would treat diseases. Not only is it accurate, it's not inaccurate. Meaning, he's not, the, the Bible doesn't include, for example, when Moses was writing, Moses was brought up with the Egyptians. He learned all of their medical practices. Some of them are very bogus. The Bible doesn't include any of that. How is the Bible, now how is Moses able to discern what is actually true versus what's not in the medical field? Right. Just one example. The Bible is not a scientific book, so you have to be careful when you, when you start to use that. I want to talk a little bit about scholarship here. Did, how many people read the Christ Bible? Okay, read it because it was the shortest one on the list. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, that's not why I chose it, but I really thought that was a great book. If you get a chance, the Christ Boss, he talked about in here three types of scholarship, and it's very interesting because this is a secret that not many people talk about. You guys are at universities, right? At a university, when you write a paper, if you don't back it up with references, or disagrees with common scholarship, you're going to get ripped apart. If a professor publishes an article, and he's an expert in his field, but he hasn't looked at what other people who've examined the same evidence have come to as a, just as a, a conclusion, what kind of respect do you have for that kind of a professor? Right? His, his published materials are going to be laughed at because he's going to miss some of the general knowledge that's out there. Well, here's exactly what happens. We're going to talk about skeptics, we're going to talk about Christians, and then mainstream. Here's what happens with skeptical, skeptics. It's a little bit like Richard Dawkins talking about history. It's not his field, and he doesn't have this base of scholarship that he's basing his conclusions on. So he's spouting off an opinion. It hasn't been peer-reviewed, does anybody know what peer reviewed is? You know, when you send it out before it goes published in a in a magazine, it has to be peer reviewed so that you don't embarrass the magazine by publishing something that's not true. So, what the skeptics do is they actually just want to catch a headline. How many times have you read something in the newspaper that said something about Jesus? Jesus' wife found buried in Galilee. If you saw that, would you read that article? Yeah, yeah I mean, I want to know. Jesus, why? Who's the wife? Oh, you know. So what the skeptics do is they try to grab your attention with headlines rather than using the scholarly base. And then, so even the, these guys may have credentials. It's sort of like Richard Dawkins being this incredible evolutionary biologist. He's got credentials, but maybe not in that field. The anesthesiologist writing on the side about the Bible is a little different than the professor of biblical studies from Oxford University writing about the Bible. I'm not saying that every professor of biblical studies out there has his act together, but it's, a, it's very 
if it hasn't even been matched against some of the known conclusions that people have come to, then it's not considered scholarly. So I put it in quotes. This is not scholarship. This is trying to grab headlines. And most skeptics who have books out there are in this category. It's not an academic renewed document. Unfortunately, most Christians are equally guilty. We make our arguments, they're circular, they work very well for the Christian who already believes. They do not follow a scholarly review process. They don't take into account some of the things that have already been looked at. And some of you, when you heard, for example, form criticism or source criticism or textual criticism, that's the scholarly observation and study of certain disciplines. I'm not saying you need to become an expert in any of those fields, praise God. Do I get an amen on that? Amen. However, you need to be at least mildly familiar with them if you're going to venture into this topic. Somebody asked me yesterday, do you speak Greek? Or have you studied Greek? I took two semesters of Greek. That's enough to be dangerous and dysfunctional. <laughs> That it's not enough to say, I understand, or let me give you my scholarly opinion on the Greek word. We have to be very careful in thinking that just because I read a book on it some, at some point, and we pull out that canned answer. I got a can of tomato sauce, you want to drink it? You know? I mean, that is not what we're trying to do. And we have to be humble in our approach. I don't know the answer, but here are some of the things that I've read. And just really be a lot more humble the way we answer, because... We're guilty of defending the faith using arguments that don't take into account scholarly review and, and really going through the whole process. That's not wrong, but take it for what it is. If we're going to criticize the skeptic for doing it, we better drink our own medicine. And finally, you have this mainstream peer review. Here's the 